Hi, my name is Divna, Divna Manolova, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Center for Medieval Literature at the University of York and the University of Southern Denmark. And I'm recording this video so that I can share with you a few thoughts uh, about labyrinths in medieval manuscripts. Um, I should start by saying that this is not my uh, not my core specialization. I am a historian of science and a Byzantinist. Um, and I'm not really a specialist of the kind of uh, labyrinth you are all going to walk into uh, when you visit the labyrinth uh, for well-being in front of King's Manor in New York. However, when I heard about the project, I really wanted to take part in it and to think together with you about one particular example of a medieval labyrinth in a medieval manuscript book, which I had encountered in my work uh, and I was deeply fascinated by. So I, I thought this is a great opportunity to pick it up again and to see what I can come up with and what I can tell you uh, about it. And that particular book is called the Libek Florgidus. It dates to the 12th century and eventually we'll get to it. But first, some preliminary thoughts. I think uh, some of you may have uh, visited uh, the Chartres Cathedral, or you may be familiar with the kind of medieval la labyrinth that is included uh, in the architectural space of medieval cathedrals. And here, this is one of the most famous examples. And you can see people walking through it just as you are probably walking in, uh, through the labyrinth in front of King's Manor. So obviously, this is a kind of labyrinth that is also constructed and um, incorporated in a Christian context. And in this sense, we can think about the sort of moral or moralizing function of medieval labyrinths. So you can think about the path that um, the medieval person is supposed to walk towards uh, um, as they enter the labyrinth. And that path can have multiple meanings. I think that's one of the main aspects of labyrinths and that's why they're so fascinating because they are symbols of, or they, they exemplify complexity and they have multiple meanings. And so you can think of that path as a path towards heaven, towards salvation. And therefore, if one is on such a path, the key word, I guess, would be perseverance, right? Per perseverance towards that end goal. However, it can also be interpreted um, as a path towards hell, right? And in that case, uh, we would have persistence in sin as the key word, persistence in the wrong moral choice. But if we put the Christian context aside, I think what we can think about um, when it comes to labyrinths and medieval labyrinths in particular, it can be the fact that, that they exemplify artistry. Even in thinking back to the myth of the labyrinth and its constructor Daedalus, this ingenious sculptor and engineer. So you have that ingenious device, which is architectural, but not only. Uh, it's full of wonders, also slightly scary. Uh, so in this sense, that paradigm of complexity that the labyrinth is presents us also with the idea of the artistry of the craftsman. And we can then metaphorically transfer it to other objects. So we can think of the path of the labyrinth as a path towards knowledge and indeed also towards self-knowledge, right? So we can connect it to, uh, for instance, to philosophical thinking, the intricacy of trying to solve a different difficult pro problem because the labyrinth is also a problem to be solved. And we can also think about it uh, in comparison and in connection to composition and the composition of a text, for instance, of a medieval book. So these are also complex structures, a text, a narrative, a story. Um, it is not a simple line. It is. It works on multiple levels. Or a medieval encyclopedia, such as the Liber Floridus, we are going to discuss later on. Uh, equally, it is a very complex thing. And in this sense, the labyrinth is really a metaphor and a form and a paradigm for these different types of complexity and problem solving that we might want to think about. Mm -hmm. But before we go deeply into the medieval period, I think we can also, of course, think back to the original myth 
uh, which you are all very familiar with, the myth of the Minotaur, uh, of the labyrinth which is built by Daedalus, um, of King Minos, uh, and of that mythical creed that uh, we are all familiar with. And I would just like to point uh, towards several contemporary examples of that, myth, that myth's retelling. Um, and here on the slide, I'm showing you two novels and one artwork, which I thought work well with our theme. So first, you may want to think back to Gheorghe Gospodinov's The Physics of Sorrow, in which um, that um, very familiar, monstrous figure of the Minotaur is being recast in a very different light as uh, the figure of an abandoned child. Or you may want to think back to Madeleine Miller's Circe, where indeed uh, the craftsman, uh, the genius of Daedalus, is he is a very important uh, character in the story. And uh, thirdly, you can think about such murals as the one I'm showing you in the slide by uh, Johanna Poitig, um, installed in San Francisco in 1999. Um, and called Labyrinth Habitat. And I would just like to read to you the way she thought of uh, what the labyrinth does as she conceived this artwork. Um, so she, she wrote, the labyrinth both creates and protects the center and allows entry only on the correct terms. Entry is, the, is thus a step on the path of knowledge. It is something to think about as we move towards the medieval uh, labyrinths in medieval manuscripts. And I invite you also to think to that shape as it would not be dissimilar to what we are going to look at when we move to this 12th century encyclopedia I mentioned to you, the Lipek Florvidus. And I think now it's time uh, to move and to speak about labyrinths in medieval books. Uh, and in this sense, they are quite similar to what has been included on your Labyrinth uh, for Wellbeing leaflet. Uh, you may uh, remember this. Uh, this is something you could have downloaded from the website of the event. It is a finger labyrinth and it comes with instructions how to use it and uh, what to think about as you're doing it. So in the sense, um, that this is a representation of a labyrinth on a piece of paper that's not different, not very much different from what I'm going to show you and talk to you about in the next few minutes. And here is our first encounter with this beautifully illustrated and indeed quite enigmatic work, the Liber Florgidus, um, which as you can see was completed around 1121. As far as we know, it was a long process with many stages and there are many reductions uh, that happened. What you see is a copy of uh, the Lipek Florvidus, and indeed this is the autograph copy um, executed by Lambert, canon of the Church of Our Lady and Saint Omer. Uh, so this is the original, if I may call it so. And we are seeing the opening of uh, Folio Folia 19 verso and 20 recto. And as you can see on the right hand side, there is the labyrinth we are going to be looking at. But you might want to have a little bit more of an idea where that uh, place uh, called Saint Omer is. So here is a map, and Saint Omer is here. And here next to it is Ghent, where currently the manuscript uh, is preserved in the University Library of the Ghent University. And Lambert uh, actually included and made sure that we have an image of him as well. Um, so he included this uh, portrait of himself as the author in the manuscript. Now this is a little, just a little bit of background information, but I thought it would be useful for you to contextualize and to situate that labyrinth, that particular place. Uh, which is confusing, and yet it is a place. Um, so I thought it's good to have it situated within a particular historical context, so the 12th century, and then within a geographical location on the map of uh, Europe. Now, uh, we should also mention um, a little, um, uh, a few details that you can see on the page. So I think the one I want to focus on is indeed the title. So here you have um, in Latin, 
um, the following transcription, which here you can see in the translation of uh, Albert de Gaulle. Uh, namely, it says, the house of Daedalus, in which King Minus plays the Minotaur. So it gives us the details of what we are looking at. It gives us three, the names of the three of the very important characters, the king, the craftsman, and the Minotaur, who actually dwells and lives in this house. Right. Um, I thought at this point it's also worthwhile mentioning that in the same city of Saint-Omer, but in a, a, a different part um, of that city, uh, namely at the Abbey Church of Saint-Bartin. Uh, there we know that there was uh, within the church a quadrangular labyrinth which is now lost and which was placed over the tomb of William, son of Count Robert II of Jerusalem. Uh, and around the same time as this book was being produced. As you can see, uh, William died in 1109. Of course, one labyrinth which we cannot anymore see was rectangular um, and quadrangular as I say on this slide How, and this one that you're seeing on the page is uh, circular so they are quite different but I wanted to show that we have a coexistence in place in time of the kind of labyrinth that you find in a medieval cathedral or in an abbey church at this in this particular example, and the kind of labyrinth that is executed in a medieval book within the same time and space. And I think that's also worthwhile thinking about. Now, in this next slide, I want to show you how this medieval labyrinth was used, because we can see traces of its use. And think back to the finger labyrinth you have been provided with and how you could follow it. So if we zoom in on this page, I think you can see the faint traces of people following the path of the labyrinth. So you can see how a medieval hands with their instruments basically followed this and indeed did the pilgrimage, the path. They walked the path towards the center. Um, and what I have done in the next minute is to recreate that situation by trying to walk this particular labyrinth myself. And I'm going to show you uh, a video. As you can see, I've printed the, um, the page, uh, th that particular folio from uh, the Liber Floribus manuscript on an A3 sheet of paper. So I've done this as obviously I could not uh, trace the labyrinth in the medieval book itself, but luckily it is um, digitized and available on the internet for all of us to see, and later on I'll show you a link, so you can follow up on this and um, maybe leave through the digital version yourself. So here I've uh, printed it out and I have done a little ex experiment of following the path. And as you can see here, I am at the beginning, and I think here in this close-up, you can see again the trace marks of people doing the same thing that I'm doing in this video. And as you are watching this experiment, what I would like to share with you a few thoughts about the process you are observing that I had as I as I practiced myself. So I think the first thing I want to bring to your attention is that when we have depictions of medieval, um, of labyrinths or labyrinth diagrams as this one in medieval manuscripts, we always see them in superposition. So we always see them uh, from above. Um, from, we have a bird's eye view on the labyrinth. This is quite different from the experience you would have if you are in an actual labyrinth and you are walking through it, but you can never see the whole. So I think when you are walking into a, into a labyrinth where you don't have this kind of bird's eye view, your perspective is very important. Um, depending on where you are, you will see a different thing. And here um, I would like to quote from Penelope Reed-Dupe, who uh, in 1990 published 
fact, a monograph on the idea of the labyrinth from classical antiquity through the Middle Ages. And she, she also had uh, similar thoughts. She said, what you see depends on where you stand. Ch change your perspective and the labyrinth seems to change. However, when we look at this kind of uh, representations of labyrinths in medieval manuscripts, we see it all. We see it from above and uh, we have the whole picture. We see where the, where the center is and we can uh, follow the path, let's say, with less anxiety and with less danger. Um, it is also curious that uh, to know that among these European representations of labyrinths, the majority of them are uh, unicursal as this one. So we don't have many fork paths. They are not mazes. They are labyrinths. There is a single path to the center that one is supposed to follow. You can also think as you watch me uh, do this experiment, you may have noticed that at the beginning, the meandering path of the labyrinth brings me very quickly to the center, but then it takes me out of it again. So there is this meandering experience that is happening. And I also thought, okay, meandering is fine, but what if the page was actually blank? How would I navigate that, right? So once there is a labyrinth, we could also say that there is also a map. So the labyrinth is not simply a puzzle to be solved. After all, it provides the solution at the same time. In this sense, it is a map and uh, it is a diagram at the same time. And in, as it is a map, we can be, as I said that it is a map, we can also be reminded of the fact that it is a map of a specific place, a place we have seen uh, and I have shown you that it is indicated at the top of the page as the house of Daedalus, the one in which the Minotaur uh, lives. I also invite you to consider how long it took to do this, um, to follow the labyrinth in the Liber Floridus. So it took about a bit less than three minutes. So if you think about it, it is not something you can really do fast. You're supposed to have patience for this and you're supposed to deal with the meandering path that sometimes takes you closer and sometimes it takes you further away. It's also important not to get confused even if there is a single path towards the center. I myself had to do it a few times uh, because I kept losing my way and forgetting in which of those concentric circles I was in. Uh, and as I say concentric circles, I'm also thinking that um, that's another thing I would like to point out to you. As I said, this is a, a sort of a diagram that in, in medieval manuscripts we always see from above from this bird's eye view. In this sense, it is um, quite similar to um, such diagrams that depict the universe. Of course, we're in the Middle Ages, so you should think that the Earth would be in the middle and you would have um, the planets and the moon and the sun rotating around it. In this kind of image of the universe, of the medieval cosmos, we would have a center and concentric nested circles that move around that center, but there'll be no path towards the center. The center is the Earth, the inhabited world where humanity lives is already in. It. It's already in the center. Whereas here, within a labyrinth, we are outside outside that place, but we are invited to enter and to walk the path towards the center. So in this sense, even though technically how this diagram is made, the one of the labyrinth, uh, very often they are um, what is executed first is to draw with a compass these concentric nested circles and then to introduce the breaks and the twists afterwards. So there is a common element between models of the universe in medieval manuscripts and diagrams of the labyrinth. However, thinking about the possibility that this is an image that invites you in, I would like to point you out to what is on its other side, so on the left hand side of that particular opening. What you see here is a circular diagram 
which is subdivided um, in various sections. And what it represents are uh, the six ages of the world. So it speaks about the history, the prehistory, uh, the past. It speaks about the past uh, empires and the past great kings um, and the story of the nations uh, before that moment in which Lambert is preparing his medieval book. Um, so when you contrast the two, on the left side, you have another circular image with a center, but as you can see, there is no path towards it. This is the past, this is history. Uh, at the same time, on the right, we have a mythical place, or at least um, partly mythical place, that's also uh, partly real, because Crete is a real island that we know exists in our world. Um, so you have a mythical place, but you are invited to enter. And again, I'm, I would like to remind you of the trace marks we saw of people actually, medieval hands actually entering that particular uh, labyrinth. Um, and as I'm concluding, I would also like to read to you, going back again to contemporary or um, non-medieval treatments of the labyrinth, um, I would like to quote to you, to read a quote uh, from a very famous short story uh, by uh, Jorge Luis uh, Borges, which he wrote in 1941. And uh, in the original uh, Spanish, it is called El Jardín de Senderos que se bifurcan. It was the first short story uh, of his that was translated into English by uh, Anthony Boucher. And uh, its title in English is The Garden of the Forking Paths. So um, this particular passage describes the kind of feelings that one may have as they think and as they contemplate a labyrinth. And I thought it might be um, something worthwhile reading together as you're looking at this medieval book, as you're thinking about the Liber Floridus, and as you're maybe thinking about walking the labyrinth in front of King's Manor. So Borges wrote uh, in the voice of his uh, character, the advice about turning always to the left reminded me that such was the common formula for finding the central courtyard of certain labyrinths. I know something about labyrinths. Not for nothing, I am the great grandson of Tui Pen. He was governor of Yunnan and gave up temporal power to write a novel with more characters than they are in Hang Lu Meng and to create a maze in which all men would lose themselves. He spent 13 years on these oddly assorted tasks before he was assassinated by a stranger. His novel had no sense to it, and nobody ever found his labyrinth. Under the trees of England, I meditated on this lost and perhaps mythical labyrinth. I imagined it untouched and perfect and the secret sum on the secret summit of some mountain I imagined it drowned on the rice paddies or beneath the sea. I imagined it infinite, made not only of eight-sided pavilions and of twisting paths, but also of rivers, provinces and kingdoms. I thought of a maze of mazes, of a sinuous, ever-growing maze, which would take in both past and future and would somehow involve the stars. So, as you can see in this, uh, in this quote from Borges, um, we have several of the elements we were thinking about together as we looked at this opening. He mentions a labyrinth that's infinite, so as to encompass the past and the future. A labyrinth that's possibly mythical, but yet exists on top of some mountain, and a labyrinth that's somehow connected to it, the stars. And as I mentioned to you, the structure of this particular lab of circular labyrinths such as this one is very similar to the structure of astronomical and cosmological diagrams in medieval manuscripts. So there you ha we have the stars again. And on this note, um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, my musings on the medieval labyrinths in the Liber Floridus. And uh, I would like just to give you some practical information how to continue this journey if you wish to. Uh, you let the Liber Floridus, its Ghent copy, that is the autograph uh, copy of the, of the, of the 
of this medieval encyclopedia is available online. And here you can see um, the link. Uh, this directs you to the Ghent University uh, library, spe especially dedicated website, where you can learn more about uh, this medieval encyclopedia, its author, its context. And also, uh, here I'm showing you on the right, that there is a page with the various copies of the Liber Floridus. So some um, of the others are also digitized, so you can browse and see different labyrinths included uh, in different medieval copies of that particular uh, work. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank to uh, several people who have um, been instrumental in uh, my engagement with this uh, video. So, first of all, I would like to thank to Lydia Zeldenrust and Gillian Galway from the Center uh, from Medieval Studies and the University of York. I would like to thank to the creators of the Labyrinth for Wellbeing project, Peter Clark, Janet Eldred and Catherine Wright. Um, special thanks to uh, Wim Verbal and Henrik de Fort. The Hen um, Henrik is the curator of ancient collections at the University Library at Kent University. So many thanks for the permission to use um, images from uh, the manuscript. And also special thanks to uh, the Art and Architecture SF for San Francisco.com that uh, who also gave me a kind permission to use their picture of the Labyrinth Habitat mural. Thank you all for your attention and enjoy the Labyrinth for well-being. <laughs>